Studio International has come to northwest London to visit Trish Wiley's studio. A graduate of Camberwell College of Art, Wiley has been engaged in making images from an early age. And by watching her father working in leather, she began to understand how materials could be made into something by using her hands. Although Wiley is drawn to a broad range of art, literature, dance, performance and music, she chooses to work as a painter for its immediacy and its solitary process. Wiley's recent works focus on the cowboy as a potent symbol in popular culture. The writer and broadcaster Sir Christopher Frayling, in his 2010 forward to Wiley's Belgravia gallery exhibition, wrote... Wiley's paintings mediate the viewer's relationship with contemporary figures of myth, providing in the process a hotline to the gods of the silver screen. Can you remember when you first became aware of cowboys? Yes, um, it was when I was very small um, and I used to watch Annie Weston on the TV with... Um, several of my older brothers and um, and that was some of the first things I remember actually and you... I must have been about three, two, three years of age very young yeah, in fact the first words I ever said according to my mum and dad was um, I was jumping up and down on the end of their bed and I just shouted out um, these words, Gigi Fury, Cheyenne Bang. <laughs> and I think that was before I'd said Mum and Dad. <laughs> How wonderful. What movie was that? Do you remember? No, it, it's, it's not from a film at all. It's actually, um, Cheyenne was the name of um, a Western character in a TV series. Fury was the name of a horse in a TV series. And um, Gigi is a, is a slang name for a horse. And bang, I guess, is about a gun going off. So, you know, it's like a, you know, um, it's just connecting all those things together as a small child. So I was coming up to being 50. And up until then, I'd gone through different ways of working. And Such as? Can you give us a quick... Yeah, and I, I, before that, I was doing encaustic work hot wax and okay. you put you put pigments in it's i think it's the oldest form of paint making there is so i think the egyptians used it and they you you have to make it hot you heat up the wax so it's fluid and then as it dries very quickly as it cools down and it's um it's a very sensual um medium but it's very labour intensive and I used to like to work very big but it was incredibly uh, time consuming. A lot of encaustic painters I think don't work so big. Um, and I would do things like take thumbprints and lip prints and enlarge them. Um, there was a big thumbprint I did uh, and made it six foot by five and painted it with beeswax where I went I went and collected the, the wax from a local uh, beekeeper and um, and so consequently when you went up to the painting you could smell the light honey off it, it was lovely and it's very tactile uh, so anyway I was doing that and it just so happened one day well I was really sort of hanging around and relaxing at home on a Saturday morning reading The Guardian, that I saw uh, that The Magnificent Seven was going to be on TV that afternoon. And I, I didn't have a television. And, um, and I remember saying to uh, my, my partner um, at the time, saying to him, oh, you know, I'd love to see The Magnificent Seven. I haven't seen it for so long. And... Uh, you know, me haven't got a telly and blah, 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 blah. And then I just thought, oh, well, I'll paint it. And it just, and I just went from there and I, and I couldn't sleep. I was so excited that I was going to do this painting. And, um, and I just cut out the little picture that was in the ad for the TV programme. And I was working out how am I going to do this. 
And I worked out that I was going to make it very big. So I bought three big canvases that I put together and um, uh, did this painting. And I thought it was just going to be one that I was doing and I'd go back to what I was doing before. But I didn't. I suddenly found I'd opened up something uh, in myself. Because up until then, I don't think only my, my family knew about my cowboy past. <laughs> and I'd, um, uh, I hadn't really, um, I, had, I hadn't connected that with, with my art practice. And then suddenly, as soon as I did, it just opened so much up for me. Um, and um, yeah, it was a real, actually, it was a real light bulb moment, really. That, so. And they are, well one is, is that I can work more quickly, so whereas when I'm oil painting, I have to wait for the paint to dry, it's such a, such a more lengthy process, and working on paper with pastels, I can work, uh, and work through ideas much more quickly, they, you know, it still comes off. Like you fix it several times and it's still, they're so delicate really. That's why there's short, you know, you'll find that there's dust everywhere. Can you tell us how you select an image or a scene from a film? to make a work from? I will be looking at the films over a long period of time with the sound off. Um, and I'm purely looking at the images. So, for instance, when I was um, beginning to look at Sergio Leone films, with his uh, opening sequence of um, uh, Once Upon a Time in the West, one of the key things about his filmmaking was his close-ups. And um, they appear right at the beginning, and it's all this, no dialogue, just close-ups. And, and they're fantastic. So um, I, I watched just the beginning of that film over and over and over again, um, with the sound off, and um, then would settle on, on one frame. Um, and so, and often I would go back again and again to just make sure before I'd start work that that's what I wanted to do. Um, because when you actually start to look at a film uh, in that sort of detail, you see such a big difference between one twenty-fourth of a second and another. A close-up has very strong meaning in film language. And um, sometimes it isn't always the case. Sometimes I'll, I'll uh, see something where I want the uh, person to fill the picture plane. So I'll use the um, projector to actually zoom in. So in a way, you're, you're able to re-edit, to a certain extent, what the filmmaker has already edited or had edited and made. So, um, and... It's so that I think it's so that I don't want the picture plane to be too complicated, and I want the face to be the the landscape in a way, or oh, mm, because it's wonderful that thing about close-ups because never before have people seen a face so big. You know, if you think of how huge a cinema screen was, mm. um, and uh, um, and and therefore that meant that you could have a a theatre full of people watching a film and they could react to somebody's emotions that are shown on the cinema screen. So it's, it's actually having that huge presence um, that meant that the relationship between in storytelling changed, you know, because you could have just one person, one face, filling a screen in front of hundreds of people. I'm constantly looking at films and seeing very much painterly sort of influence in many films because a lot of uh, cinematographers and directors of photography are 
it's what they're interested in is light and 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 so many people have um, in that in that uh, uh, work, including directors, look at paintings in order to inform their their filmmaking really of how the film's going to look. So I don't adhere to any sort of story from a film. Um, I think what I tend to do, because some of this is on quite a uh, an unconscious level really. Um, but I think that they are things that actually represent something or instill a feeling in me. But I think goes back a very long way um, for me personally, but I think also culturally. Um, so uh, I know so many people of my age group and older, their understanding of uh, the mythology of a cowboy um, is very, runs quite deep, whereas, uh, you know, young people today, their idea of that would be completely different. You know, Westerns were on television a bit like, um, uh, in the way that sort of maybe reality TV now is, is, is sort of like a, a, a common language for young people to sort of grasp hold of. When I was a little girl, I, I grew up in a very large family. There was 10 children in our family and we lived in a small flat in, in Stockwell in South London. And one of the things was that watching on this very small TV screen in the corner of the living room, you saw these panoramic vistas and people riding around on horses and it looked incredibly open and free. So uh, growing up in an urban area, in, in quite a crowded flat, um, I think there was always that notion of, of, of loving space. So I think there's that in that too. Very romantic. You know, and as a child when I was growing up, there were still bomb sites everywhere in London and we used to go and play on the bomb sites. So, and often you'd be playing and reenacting things from a Western, you know. So um, I was very much a tomboy. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so um, I, think, I think that I'm not consciously looking for a story from a particular filmmaker as such, but I will stitch together or put together images that I feel uh, says something really quite strongly about that filmmaker or maybe the actor, not necessarily the, the film. This is Montgomery Cliff from Red River, uh, Howard Hawks film made in the 40s, black and white. All of, all of these drawings are from black and white films. But as you can see, that black and white doesn't actually mean black and white. When you closely scrutinise these uh, images, um, that you see that actually uh, the process means that lots of other colours are coming through, even though we read it as black and white from a distance. So I like to be able to try and catch some of that, or a lot of that, in fact. Um, and there was, I do remember when I was a little girl, I used to go right up to the television screen to see how the picture, how was that, how did that happen? How was that face on that screen? Um, and of course, when you go close up, it becomes an abstract series of marks, really. And as I, uh, I used to be an abstract painter before I was doing the encaustic work. Before then, I was um, very much uh, a non-figurative painter. So with this, it's sort of, I feel I'm pulling together lots of parts of my self as a, as a, as a painter and bringing it together in fact. I, I suspect that had I have not uh, painted in a non-figurative way for must have been nearly 10 years then my approach to this would be very different. I, I did this over a year ago. I had a residency um, at Windsor and Newton where I had a bigger studio. They often get me to try out different paints and stuff like that and um, uh, and they just offered me this space so that I had two studios. I had one that was bigger um, to make big 
works more comfortably. Um, and uh, so I did a series of paintings there, which and was over a year ago, in fact. And this is one of them. Yeah, yeah. And 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 it's Lee Van Cleef. Um, of course, widescreen came in more later on in in as cinema develops, um, and uh, so. Often what would happen is that when you had a film being shown on television, because your TV screen had a different aspect ratio, the films wouldn't actually fit on the TV screen. Maybe you're putting in something very wide on something very square, but in order to include the whole image, they would make it smaller, but you would end up with a gap underneath and on the top. And so they blacked that out, and it was called letterboxing. Oh. And there's a similar thing that's done from the sides, and that's called pillar boxing. <laughs> um, and it will just, uh, I think often now, it, you can still see it on a computer. We're sort of not conscious of it, you know. I remember we used to be when TVs were very small, and you really noticed when the film was on, and they'd do that thing of squashing it in. Um, uh, and um, uh, but I, I, I'm not sure how often now people actually notice those things. We're very good at just focusing on the image and getting rid of all the periphery in a way because we're so much more used to looking at images on different screens now. So do you, how do you apply that to your painting? Um, I just use them as an artificial device. It's, I find it an interesting uh, device to bring into play. Um, and uh, um, because I think it will, uh, it works. Sometimes I just feel it works and it gives me room to, uh, there's been times when I've done pink, <laughs> pink um, pillar boxing. Um, so it's, and, and, and the hope is that some people who are very interested in film will understand maybe that reference, but you don't have to. Um, because just in terms of a painting, you know, it works. Well, I hope it works, that's why I do it, you know. Mm. This is Clint Eastwood. Um, in uh, a TV series called Warhide, which I think ran for about six years in the mid to late 50s, early 60s. And he played a character called Rowdy Yates. And I think it's the only black and white uh, filming he's been in that I could find. Uh, all his films have been in colour. Um, and when he was Rowdy Yates, he was a TV star. And um, in those days, you either were a TV star or a movie star. You didn't actually cross over. Um, and of course television was in its infancy really and was still very influenced by filmmaking as to how programmes were made. Um, and uh, Clint Eastwood was discovered really or uh, became the Clint Eastwood we all know because of Sergio Leone casting him in um, uh, A Fistful of Dollars. And the reason why he wanted Clint Eastwood was because he could afford him, because he was cheap, because he was a TV star. And, um, uh, and, and it, was, it was really because of that that um, that changed his whole career. You know, up until then he was playing this very squeaky clean, nice cowboy on Rawhide. Uh, after Fistful of Dollars, he changed completely. His character was uh, very silent and um, aggressive, quietly aggressive, um, and um, very solitary. Mm -hmm. um, so this is... Uh, I wanted to find images of him before he became, you know, the man with no name and the Clint Eastwood that everybody now knows and associates with him.